Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back for the third and final day of what has been an extremely exciting uh, conference for all of us in Bombay. Uh, the first with uh, many scholars from around the world working on Lacan, Freud, Marx, and um, we really hope all of you will come back and visit us again soon. <laughs> Uh, today, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor William Mazzarella, who is the chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. Um, William is no stranger to Gyan Prabha. He taught a wonderful uh, seminar here last year, which is ironically uh, to do with also the title of this conference. It was titled, uh, Just What I Always Wanted. Um, and uh, William actually uh, asked or posed the question, does advertising impose false desires on consumer citizens or does it cater to already existing desires? And over the course of a few days, we as his students got to understand that this was you know, a false choice and he suggested ways of moving towards a more dynamic understanding of ourselves as subjects, but uh, also why certain objects, people and situations uh, become our sites of uh, identification and desire. Among his many research interests, uh, there is political anthropology of mass publicity, including mass media, censorship and consumerism, advertising and marketing, uh, crowds and publics, critical theory, commodity aesthetics, post-coloniality, and of course, India. Um, his books include Shoveling Smoke, Advertising and Globalization in Contemporary India, and um, Sensorium, Cinema and the Open Edge of Mass Publicity. Uh, forthcoming is the manner of mass society uh, with University of Chicago Press next year, and we had the privilege of hearing a chapter from that last year, and we will have the privilege from hearing, of hearing another uh, this morning. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Mazzarella. Ah, here we go. Thanks, Alicia, and um, really a huge thanks to everyone at uh, Gyana Pravaha, from Rashmi um, to Andre, and especially um, Rohit for the incredible work that he's put into this, making this possible, and for lending you know, enjoyment to intensity. So um, not that we should be surprised at the combination. Um, but, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be back. Um, in my own discipline, anthropology, I'm often imagined, I think, as a kind of head-in-the-clouds philosopher. But in this context, I feel like a, a kind of rather lumpen social scientist. Uh, sorry, there's some feedback going on here with the audio. Is that at the level okay? It's kind of rumbling. Okay. Um, so if you'll forgive me, this is going to be a little bit of a shift in register. Um, this is still a, a, a theoretical talk, a conceptual talk. It's, it's uh, pulled together from various parts of the book that I have recently completed, uh, and I hope it makes sense as a piece. So let me begin with a short quotation from Emile Durkheim's, the sociologist Emile Durkheim's masterpiece, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, uh, published in 1912. It's a quotation that I use at the very beginning of the book that I recently completed, this book called the manner of mass society that um, Alicia kindly mentioned. And the quotation goes like this. Uh, Durkheim writes, the stimulating action of society is not felt in exceptional circumstances alone. There is virtually no instant of our lives in which a certain rush of energy fails to come to us from outside ourselves, unquote. So one of the names that Durkheim gives to this energy, the stimulating action of society is mana. A Polynesian word, originally, meaning roughly supernatural force or efficacy or potency. Now, on the surface, Durkheim's book is concerned with what he calls collective effervescence in so-called primitive societies. But in fact, uh, the book is a meditation on one, what one could call the vital energetics of all human societies, from the smallest to the most complex, from face-to-face -face interactions to mass-mediated networks. Mana, Durkheim argues, is, quote, at once a physical force and a moral power, unquote. It's a name for that feeling of what he calls genuine respect that makes us, quote, defer to society's orders, unquote. One might experience mana, for instance, as a chief's potency, 
or as the aura of a sacred object. But mana is also dispersed and all-infusing, chronically unstable and leaky, dangerously overflowing its containers. Durkheim writes, religious forces are so imagined as to appear always on the point of escaping the places they occupy and invading all that passes within their reach. So, in one guise, mana appears here as a name for the transcendent force that guarantees moral authority, symbolic order, cultural order. But at the same time, mana is a mark of excess, of the supernatural, the surplus, the surcharge. Mana is the efficacy that exceeds and overflows basic requirements. And yet somehow its very excessiveness, somehow the way that mana always seems to embody, as it were, what is in the social more than itself, makes it both instrumentally and aesthetically indispensable. It's this double face of mana, mana as order and mana as excess, that links it to mass publicity in the register of charismatic politics, in the register of commercial publicity, and in the oratic aesthetics of artworks. Now, Durkheim's nephew, Marcel Mauss, had already left an important clue as to the connection, so to speak, between primitive and modern forms of mana when he described ritual specialists as a kind of proto-publicists, mana workers, one might say, who drew on what he called the collective forces of society. And Mose wrote, it is public opinion which makes the magician and creates the power he wields. Thanks to public opinion, he knows everything and can do anything. Now, Bronislav Malinowski, who was the inventor of modern fieldwork-based anthropology, closes the circle in the 1930s by directly comparing what he calls primitive magic to advertising. Malinowski calls advertising, quote, the richest field of modern verbal magic, unquote, and remarks that the advertisements of modern beauty specialists, especially of the magnitude of my countrywoman, Helena Rubinstein, he was Polish, or of her rival, Elizabeth Arden, would make interesting reading if collated with the formulae of Trobriand beauty magic. Now, notably, this comparison isn't intended to flatter anyone. Malinowski imagines the comparative research project here that someone might undertake as an inquiry into what he calls, quotes, parallels between modern and primitive savagery, unquote. So his distaste for what he figures as atavistic survivals in modern mass publicity is entirely conventional, however understandable given the European political climate at the time that he was writing in the 1930s. He renders, Malinowski, the magical dimensions of mass communication as tools of mass hypnosis energized by mob frenzy. So Malinowski then acknowledges, but also disparages the importance of collective energies, what most called the collective forces of society. He specifically singles out mana for contempt, Malinowski. He calls it, quote, the thin, fluid, ubiquitous mana, unquote. Ubiquitous, as far as Malinowski is concerned, in bad social science. Just a few years later, uh, in 1950, Levi-Strauss would similarly, but for different reasons, satirize what he saw as Durkheim and Mauss allowing themselves to be mystified by mana, quipping that it was in their sociology rather than in the social worlds that they were describing that mana really was or had mana. Whereas Malinowski dismissed mana as a fuzzy speculative concept that had nothing to do with empirical reality, Levi-Strauss recognized its charisma as a floating signifier. But precisely as a charismatic floating signifier, Levi-Strauss cautioned, cautioned that one had to be careful not to be seduced by it. But are there non-prejudicial and yet critical ways of thinking mana and mass publicity together? Are there ways in which we might still productively pick up on the speculative hints that Durkheim and others left around the turn of the last century? This is not just a question for anthropology.
As I argue at some length, it's also a question for critical theory, where, especially from the conversation between Benjamin and Adorno, we have the whole rich, tortured tradition of reflection on the oratic politics of artworks, of the culture industries, the cult of authority, in short, the problem of the mana of mass society. Now, while Benjamin was in the middle of his never-to-be-finished arcades project, he wrote to his friend and sponsor, Max Horkheimer. In his letter, Benjamin remarked that the fate of art in the 19th century has something to say to us only because it is contained in the ticking of a clock whose striking of the hour has just reached our ears. Now, that's pretty much my feeling about this tricky, slippery concept of mana as well, that even though it appears to be a late 19th and early 20th century fixation, perhaps it's only now beginning to disclose its relevance to our present-day concerns. So let's say that this is the underlying premise of my project, that mana has something to say to us only because it's contained in the ticking of a clock whose striking of the hour has only just reached our ears. In his study of eros and magic in the European Renaissance, the historian of religion, Ioan Culliano, uh, writes, we would tend to say that the actual magician and the prophet have now vanished. More probably, however, they've simply been camouflaged in sober and legal guises. Nowadays, the magician busies himself with public relations, propaganda, market research, sociological surveys, publicity, information, counterinformation and misinformation, censorship, espionage, and even cryptography, a science which in the 16th century was a branch of magic. So like the ancient and Renaissance magicians, Culliano suggests, a modern needs an exquisite sense for potential erotic resonances and bonds between people, images, and things. Now, two points need to be made here. First, Culliano is suggesting that the work of a publicity worker, like that of a magician, consists in identifying latent potentials that are imminent to relations between people, images, and things. These are the potentials that, when activated, can trigger desire and identification, a kind of actualizing encounter that following Peter Sloterdijk, I want to call constitutive resonance. The idea of constitutive resonance blurs a division that many old school anthropologists tended to draw between participation, which is sensuous and the province of the primitive, and representation, which is conceptual and the mode of the civilized. Constitutive resonance bears a family resemblance to a more familiar concept, elective affinity. For what are elective affinities? Max Weber adept, adapted the phrase from Goethe to track contingent yet germinal sympathies that in an emergent way allow both parties to a resonant relationship to become themselves via each other. Goethe had borrowed the phrase from 18th century chemistry, but those chemists were in turn adapting and scientizing long-standing esoteric traditions of attending to cosmic correspondences. So by invoking constitutive resonance as a way of thinking elective affinity, I want to stress in particular the constitutive part. Sometimes when people talk about elective affinity, they make it sound as if there are two pre-existing entities whole unto themselves, which then combine and exist in vibrant proximity to each other and so contribute to each other's flourishing. But to speak of constitutive resonance means to recognize that what we retroactively understand as separate elements that enter into a resonant relation to each other could not in fact have become themselves without that resonant relation. One could revisit then Weber's classic example of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism along these lines. So, it's not that Puritanism and capitalism each arrive fully formed in the world and then happen to find conveniently vitalizing support in the other. Rather, certain virtual potentials in a social and historical field encounter and provoke, that is call forth, literally provoke, they encounter and provoke each other so as to actualize as the formations that we will later retroactively recognize as Puritanism and capitalism. Constitutive resonance involves then a striking combination of contingency and overdetermination. Culliano notes that while the development of modern natural science has largely, and he thinks rightly, overtaken magical attempts to control the non-human world, nothing has replaced magic on its own terrain that of intersubjective relationships. 
Now, of course, there are would-be sciences of this terrain of intersubjective, uh, of constitutive resonance, particularly when it comes to mass persuasion, socioeconomic categorization, psychographic classifications, and everything that we understand as marketing. But all these, Culliano suggests, remain woefully crude and approximate compared to the minutely elaborated esoteric prescriptions of ancient and early modern magicians. As R. R. Marit wrote at the dawn of the 20th century, one of the meanings of mana is, quote, the man, this is his phrase, the man who can exercise the magic of persuasion, unquote. Now, the media theorist John Durham Peters has shown that the term communication didn't take on its modern meaning until the end of the 19th century. In other words, at the same time as mana was becoming a major scholarly preoccupation. The concept of communication is, of course, linked to notions of communion and community. As such, it carries a dense archive of mystical and magical resonances. In the 17th century, communication commonly referred to what the scholastic philosophers called actio in distance, a key problem in natural philosophy, how one body can influence another without touching it. What could be a better mutual definition of magic and of mass communication than this action at a distance? And what could better highlight, again, this blurring of participation and representation? This is how Mose describes magical action. Quote, distance does not preclude contact. Desires and images can be immediately realized, unquote. Such, too, are the dreams of close distance that thrive at the heart of mass communication when, for example, televangelists ask their followers to place their hands on the screen in order to receive the blessing. Malinowski may have been the first to make a direct connection between primitive magic and civilized advertising, but it was also Malinowski's empiricist ethnographic paradigm, this paradigm that takes over anthropology in about 1920, it was also this empiricist paradigm that blocked any serious further thinking about the mana of mass society. In response to the triumph of this empiricist settlement, I think it's worth taking a new long look at Durkheim's theory of ritual, as laid out in the elementary forms. Because it's in Durkheim's understanding of how ritual works, of what ritual does, that we get a very particular account of what we might call the, um, the origin of constitutive resonance. Or to put it a bit differently, an account of how signifiers become infused with enjoyment in such a way that they become not just meaningful, but also compelling and decisive. This, I take it, is part of what Mladen Dolar means when he muses on the energy of the signifier, or when Aaron Schuster writes of, quote, the precarious hinge between language and life. One of the things uh, worth underlining in the uh, Durkheimian quotation I began with is that he says that social energy comes to us from outside ourselves. And yet, of course, the whole point of this for Durkheim is that something that comes from outside ourselves is at the same time something that we feel intimately, viscerally. In that sense, to invoke the Lacanian term, I think we could say that mana is a way of talking about the extimate, that which is uncannily at once external and intimate, that which we experience ambivalently as part of the world that confronts us, and yet at the same time as something that is palpably, intensely, at the very core of our sense of ourselves. So in the first part of my book, I offer a detailed and interpretive genealogy of the mana concept and the many ways in which it's moved through early anthropology and later critical theory, how it was taken up, how it was refused, how it became the locus of all kinds of mischief. But in, the pr in present company here, I don't think I need to explain myself too much if I say that in a way, my book reads mana as a symptom, a symptom of a series of attempted set settlements in anthropology and critical theory Settlements that tried and necessarily failed to distinguish the speculative from the empirical, to distinguish the primitive from the civilized, and to distinguish magic from art. At first sight, Durkheim's key image of mana making, the social energy that arises when people come together in groups, right? This figure of collective effervescence in Durkheim, face to face, body to body, would seem to be all about proximity, not about influence across distance. But crucially for Durkheim, mana is not just a primitive phenomenon. It is, rather, an elementary substance that manifests in different ways in all societies, 
he says, in the hyper excitement of totemic rituals, to be sure, but also in the enthusiasm that enables unprecedented sacrifices during revolutionary events in industrial societies and in, as he puts it, the phenomenal oversupply of forces that spill over and tend to spread around a charismatic leader. So surplus enjoyment. Durkheim's recurrent instance of modern democratic collective effervescence is the French Revolution, a time not only of extraordinary collective energies, but also of new gods, albeit, as it turned out, volatile gods. It's true that Durkheim doesn't actually explicitly theorize mass-mediated forms of mana. That is to say, he doesn't say anything explicit about mana that isn't face-to-face, even his examples of modern enthusiasm are all scenarios of co-presence. The revolutionary assembly or crowd, the charismatic orator's impassioned audience. At the same time, he certainly implies the efficacy of mana across mass-mediated publics. The new ideals of the French Revolution, as he puts it, fatherland, liberty, reason, its dogma, symbols, altar, and feast days, and of course, the aura of national flags for which soldiers are prepared to die. And of course, we should recall that several of Durkheim's contemporaries and rivals, scholars like Gabriel Tard, were during those years musing on mass-mediated currents of contagious enthusiasm and, quote, the mobile atmospheres, as Tard said, of press publics. Okay, so let's take a look at what actually happens in Durkheim's ritual scene. In the beginning is the vital assembly. The electricity, as he puts it, and there's a whole argument to be had here about the metaphorics of mana and how often it draws on things like electricity. The electricity of co-presence comes first. The very act, Durkheim writes, of congregating is an exceptionally powerful stimulant. Once, once the individuals are gathered together, a sort of electricity is generated from their closeness and quickly launches them to an extraordinary height of exaltation. Primitive people, Durkheim argues, are more easily susceptible to collective effervescence, but the principle is universal. Durkheim takes core themes from the crowd theories of his day. Remember the late 19th century, early 20th century is really the heyday of crowd theory as well. Contagion, mimetic resonance. But Durkheim gives all these themes a positive twist. So he writes, Every emotion expressed resonates without interference in consciousnesses that are wide open to external impressions, each one echoing the others. So this you could have been taken from like the crowd theory of Le Bon or, or whoever from this period. Uh, the, and then he says, the initial impulse is thereby amplified each time it's echoed like an avalanche that grows as it goes along. Probably because a collective emotion cannot be expressed collectively without some order that permits harmony and unison of movement, these gestures and cries tend to fall into rhythm and regularity and from there into songs and dances. Okay, so transport, collective transport becomes transgression in Durkheim's description as sexual taboos are broken with impunity. In the heat of the moment, individuals exceed themselves and become ecstatic in every sense, at once exalted and external to themselves, rising above their workaday selves. This, says Durkheim, is at the root of the religious feeling. But unless that sacred ecstasy can be durably associated with an external object, it will f fade as surely as, quote, the celebrant eventually falls exhausted to the ground, unquote enter the totemic sign. Durkheim says, quote, the totem is the flag of the clan, unquote. It is at once fetish and name, this is my language. It absorbs and it routinizes the vital energy of the collective, concretizing and arrogating its charisma. As Durkheim notes, the image goes on calling forth and recalling those emotions even after the assembly is over. Engraved on the cult implements, on the sides of rocks, on shields, and so forth, it lives beyond the gathering. By means of it, the emotions felt are kept perpetually alive and fresh. By keep, but keeping these emotions fresh requires, in turn, the ecstatic routine of ritual. Right? So you have this ongoing dialectic. Now, the totemic sign becomes this kind of affirmative monogram of moral life in common meaningfully articulated with other signs in a signifying system. Durkheim writes, because religious force 
is none other than collective and anonymous force of the clan. And because that force can be conceived of in the form of the totem, the totemic emblem is, so to speak, the visible body of the god. And I think it's really important to remember here, I mean, this is a well-known point, but that when Durkheim says religious force, or he talks about religion, he's really just saying society, right? So this is not a specific argument about religion. It's an argument about s social life as such. So as such, the totemic sign is the very paradigm of what we could call representational potency of the energetic signifier. Durkheim is, in effect, giving us a universal sociological theory of fetishism. That is to say, an explanation of how the energies of a human collective come not only to be mediated through an external object, but also to be alienated. How they come to be perceived as inherent properties and qualities of an object, and thus separated from their social origin. But if fetishism involves misrecognition, then for Durkheim it's a necessary and fundamentally constitutive misrecognition. Social life, not only morality but also reason, would be impossible without it. In the anthropologist Roy Wagner's memorable phrase, it's, quote, an illusion with teeth in it, unquote. This is how the sequence goes in Durkheim's text. Ritual turns the raw mana arising out of collective effervescence into the cooked mana of the totemic sign. And the totemic sign then, in turn, performatively constitutes the social orders that we recognize as such. The totemic sign doesn't just represent the awareness of the social group. As Durkheim insists, quote, it serves to create and is a constitutive element of that awareness, unquote. So Durkheim's reading of the mana work of ritual, its mediation of emergent affect and symbolic order, its reproduction of representational potency, leaves us crucial clues for thinking, theorizing, the making and unmaking of meaning, value, and charismatic authority in mass-mediated contexts as well. But this is also where it becomes important to acknowledge some of the reasons why Durkheim has often been received as a conservative, even a reactionary thinker. His passionate indignation over the Dreyfus affair demonstrates that he was more than sensitive to the dark potential of the mana of mass society. And yet, at the same time, his image of primitive solidarity unambiguously idealizes uniformity and conformity. Of course, Durkheim had, in his earlier work, drawn uh, a distinction between what he called mechanical solidarity, the kind of solidarity to be expected um, in small scale and relatively homogenous societies, and on the other hand, what he called organic solidarity, a functionally differentiated kind of collective ethos that at least in theory could sustain moral life in complex societies. But it's as if Durkheim remains unable fully to deal with what a Lacanian would call the production of surplus enjoyment, even though he invokes something like it with his insistence on the leakiness of mana, the way it's constantly exceeding and escaping the signifiers that are supposed to contain it. Instead, in the Durkheimian sociological scheme, we have the happy harmony of primitive society on the one side, where jouissance and signification are, through the work of ritual, kept adequate to each other. And on the other hand, we have the so far incomplete project of modern society, where the rituals that would ensure an equivalent adequacy between enjoyment and meaning have yet to be invented. So another crucial shortcoming in Durkheim's theory of ritual is its inability to explain what we would call addressability, or to put it in Althusserian language, interpolation. It offers us no way to explain how it is that certain human subjects and certain non-human objects come to resonate with each other so as to allow a constitutive bond to form between them, a bond that allows both subject and object to become themselves via each other. Having given us the ritual scene as the origin of the affectively resonant sign, Durkheim has no real answer to the question, why this sign? Instead, the story that Durkheim tells about how the effervescence of the collective infuses the totemic sign is at once contingent and tautological. According to Durkheim, the totemic sign interpolates the individual participant in the ritual because it happens to be what is in front of his eyes at the crucial moment of ecstatic self-transcendence. But it happens to be before his eyes at that crucial moment because it's already the totemic sign. Now, as he says, now what does he see around him? What is available to his senses and what attracts his attention is the multitude of totemic images surrounding him. 
So conveniently, this whole circle of overdetermined representational potency and ideological interpolation is closed as the primitive discovers that he already bears the same marks on his body, right? The decorations on various parts of his body are so many totemic marks, repeated everywhere and in every form. How could that image not fail to stand out in the mind with exceptionally sharp relief? At this point, one can only exclaim, pleased to meet me. In a way, one could say that the conceptual problem with the Durkheimian ritual scenario is this. It offers us a concrete illustration of the mediation of collective affect and totemic sign, that is to say, the mediation of life and form. But it is as if for Durkheim there are two separate entities that are laminated onto each other by means of the heat of the ritual. First you fire up the collective effervescence, then the totemic sign moves into position, and hey presto, the vital sign. Durkheim's ritual scenario does suggest the way of thinking how life can be made imminent to form, i.e. how a form like the totemic sign or a consumer brand or a set of ideological signifiers of whatever kind can come to be charged with its own constitutive vitality in a way that's not just the borrowed light of classical fetishism. But it has much less to say about the other side of the coin. How is form imminent to life? That is to say, what is it about a particular social context that, as it were, allows certain forms not just to emerge, but also to stick? What is it at a certain time and place that makes certain forms definitive and compelling? A clan totem, a clan totemic sign, as Durkheim points out, is hereditary and collective. As a problem of interpolation, the clan totem is really just a matter of how rituals align us with invest us in a predecided generic badge of identity. But what is it that makes us addressable by particular signs? What is it about the resources of life that are in and around us that makes them available to resonate with that particular sign form? What is it that provokes us? What, taking the word provoke, again, quite literally, as a calling forth of something. This too, as Michel Lery once beautifully noted, is a question of fetishism, and this is one of my favorite quotations of all time. True fetishes are the objectified forms of our desire, the sentimental ambivalence, a tender sphinx which one nourishes always at the center, center of oneself. Here too, life is imminent to form, just as form is imminent to life. The question of our deep addressability is by no means reducible to a problem of psychology, the presumption of highly intimate and individualized resonances rather anticipated and built, is anticipated and built into the generalized voice of mass publicity. Indeed, this is a core aspect of the mana of mass publicity, what I would call its intimate anonymity, the way in which a generalized communication can feel as if it's addressing us in the depths of our particular personality. As Michael Warner has taught us so well, the point about public forms of address is that they address us intimately, individually, precisely insofar as they also and at the same time address us as members of a potentially infinite series of others. There are certainly other questions to be asked about Durkheim's ritual theory, including what it may offer us as a theory of charismatic authority. The way that Durkheim's ritual theory most often gets taken up now in social theory, if it gets taken up at all, is as a key to large-scale spectacular occasions of collective effervescence, sporting events, political rallies, mega events of various kinds. But this seems to me to be an over-literal and rather uninteresting way of reading Durkheim. It really amounts to little more than trying to find contemporary examples of collective effervescence that are kind of like supersized versions of the Australian corroboree. There are much more interesting questions to pursue. For example, questions of scale and formality. Ideally, we should be equipped to think of life and form all the way from the level of transnational dynamics to individual biographies, not to mention, as many are urging today, beyond the human altogether. And we don't have to imagine the mediation of life and form as something that takes place only in highly formalized and structured ways. Highly scripted ritual forms are at one end, but equally important are all the emergent tactics by which we try to manage the push and pull of fleeting suggestions, seductions, potentials, disinclinations. I explore this in my book in terms of what I call the fractalization of mana. Now, Durkheim sharply opposes religion to magic. Religion, he says, is a matter of collective 
categorical imperatives. By contrast, according to Durkheim, magic is an entirely instrumental realm of what he calls secular utility. Now, clearly contrasting religion and magic in this way has profound implications for any understanding of the political dimensions of ritual. One could, of course, read Durkheim against himself and reinterpret his category of magic, of secular utility, as something like a kind of subaltern practice vis-a-vis -vis the priestly hegemony of religion. In fact, this is something like what Marcel Mauss, Durkheim's nephew, seems to be saying when he argues in his book on magic that the practices we call magical involve a proto-transgressive marginality. Uh, Mauss says, a magical rite is any rite which does not play a part in organized cults. It is private, secret, mysterious, and approaches the limits of a prohibited rite. Unlike in Durkheim, for Mauss, the distinction between magic and religion is as much political and historical as it is logical. And he says, all Jews were ma magicians in the eyes of the Alexandrians, for example, as well as for the medieval church. So Moses' book on magic was, like Durkheim's elementary forms, ostensibly concerned with primitive practices. Like Durkheim, Moses assumed mana to be at the root of both religious feeling and magical efficacy, a key to understanding both collective morality and personal charisma. But Moses is particularly suggestive on the relation between the magician's work and the tides and potentials of public opinion. To begin with, Moss understands the relation between the mana work of the magician and the potentials of public opinion as a dialectical one. So, at one level, the magician appears singularly powerful in his very person. He seems inherently charismatic. Moss writes, his words, his gestures, his glances, even his thoughts are forces in themselves. His own person emanates influences before which nature and men, spirits and gods must give way. And yet, the magician's efficacy, most understands, relies on public potentials that are external to him and yet palpably actualized only in him. So once again, it is public opinion which makes the magician and creates the power he wields. Thanks to public opinion, he knows everything and can do anything. According to Moss, magicians can only work their magic by appropriating to themselves the collective forces of society, is what he says. If a magician manipulates, then he is also, as Mose puts it, quote, his own dupe. Not only must his magnetizing work actualize potentials that dwell in the collective forces of society, but it also responds, whether cynically or sincerely, and that is always an ambiguous boundary, it also responds to an overwhelming public demand. And Mose says, the magician cannot be branded as an individual working on his own for his own benefit. He is a kind of official vested by society with authority, and it's incumbent upon the society to believe in him. He's serious about it because he's taken seriously, and he's taken seriously because people have need for him. In fact, Durkheim's elementary forms, too, is full of examples of rituals at which specialists of all kinds, priests, shamans, medicine men, officiate. But the set piece of the aboriginal corroboree the archetypal scene of collective effervescence in Durkheim's text, that ritual is notably headless, leaderless. One could read the totemic sign as the charismatic agent of the ritual, but there would still be no way to specify how its vital potential arises out of particular histories, out of particular mimetic archives. The great value of Durkheim's ritual theory is its ambitious attempt to bring together the affective liveness of participation with the semiotic durability of representation. But it's precisely when we start to consider what it would take to follow up on Durkheim's immensely suggestive nods in the direction of the manner of mass publicity that we realize how hamstrung his model remains by its unwillingness to subject the primitive ritual scene to a properly political analysis. Now, of course, plenty of anthropologists, old and new, have considered the political dimensions of ritual in productive and provocative ways, from Arnold van Gennep's The Rite of Passage to Victor Turner's The Ritual Process and much beyond. Theorists of ritual have been interested in the apparent pr paradox that the achievement of social order seems to require the ritual unleashing of disorder. The classic structural anthropology of ritual 
tended to explore social constitution and social destitution as alternating phases in a ritual sequence. Philosopher anthropologist Ernesto de Martino gave the theme an interesting twist in the late 1940s when he argued that ritual is a historical drama of world loss and world redemption. De Martino explicitly poses the question that Durkheim's ritual theory at once tries to account for and yet still in the end takes for granted. And that is the question of what grounds a lived world and why this world rather than another. If collective investments according to Durkheim have the character of a categorical imperative, then what is it that distinguishes the imperative of the one sacred order from its many competitors? The phrase that De Martino uses to describe what grounds a world, what gives a particular world both weight and authority is controlling presence. What is controlling presence? To put it in Durkheimian terms, controlling presence might be something like the compelling mediation of mana through symbolic order. And like mana, controlling presence works here as a name for both the aura of order and for what destabilizes it. What does it mean then for the work of ritual, which might also be the magician's work, to be a matter of the loss and redemption of controlling presence? For De Martino, ritual work, mana work, is necessary both to reanimate and to restabilize worlds. Controlling presence is what a world that works feels like, a world that has the quality of mananess. For De Martino, the magician, the shaman, the priest, think also the politician, the charismatic cele celebrity, the magician becomes the mediator whose action ensures the compelling presence, the constitutive resonance of a world. But his or her charismatic agency also ensures the subjective experiences of self, identification, and desire that are possible within that world. And he says, the sorcerer becomes a kind of magical Christ, the mediator for the whole community through whom the being here may be redeemed from the danger of not being here. Right at the center of De Martino's model is the idea of encounter as constitutive crisis. As inhabitants of particular worlds, we routinely experience destabilizing, sometimes traumatizing encounters with threatening situations, people, or objects. These encounters put pressure on the controlling presence, the being here of a given world, so that a new controlling presence has to be achieved out of the encounter itself. Unlike Durkheim's happy totemic harmony, De Martino presumes from the very beginning that this process of world loss and world redemption is a competitive and volatile process. A given world is compelling because of the force that it exerts against the, Christ, the worlds that threaten it. And because of the constitutive powers that it derives from the crises of its encounters with those competing worlds. That's why, for De Martino, the mana work of magic and religion exist to manage the anxiety that attaches to the fact that all worlds must appear to be something impossible, that is to say, imminently self-grounding. But this is not a simple friend-enemy logic. Redeeming a world is not only a defensive exercise in which the controlling presence of my world is a function of the existential, the existential othering or objection of your world. Rather, it's a constant and volatile compromise. For De Martino, the controlling presence of a world is sustained through setting up relations with potentially troubling external phenomena, such that they become both us and not us, at once internal to our worlds and opening up to an unfathomable outside. When the controlling presence that grounds a life world is threatened, we find ourselves in need of a double, he argues, a spirit companion, an alter ego, a being with. This is what he writes. The magical experience of a presence under tension that is in danger of discharging and must be restrained is expressed in the representation and experience of a beyond that is outside uh, of the presence, a reflection, an echo, a shadow, a similarity, a double, etc. The man and the stone, the man and the animal, or the man and his shadow are as two in one or one in two. And the presence that cannot hold its ground when confronted by the world rids itself of the risk by making a compromise. The specific example that De Martino uses here is the Melanesian Atai, which he describes as follows. Something that is connected to a person in a particular and intimate way, 
and which, because of this, is sacred, something that struck the imagination from the moment it was seen, something that the individual considered marvelous, unless it was other people who had made it appear to him as such. Now, the Atai is an intimate companion of the primitive sort, but couldn't one just as well transpose the subject's decisive encounter into the fetish space of mass publicity, where the outcome is our companionate participation in political and commercial brands? Consider this passage. His presence, that is the subject's self-identity, is fascinated. It risks being led astray and remaining fixed upon the object without being able to go beyond it, and so no longer sustains itself as a presence. The redemption consists in experiencing and considering the object as an alter ego with which a regulated and lasting, and perhaps profitable, relationship is established. The process of objectification, De Martino continues, is half accomplished in the form of a compromise. The presence that is in danger of losing control masters itself by attaching its own problematic unity to that of the object. So the advantage of De Martino's approach is that it stress stresses the existential gap that the companion object, the atai, papers over so as to produce not only an impression of coherent subjectivity, but also an impression of a self-grounding controlling presence, a self-grounding world. In Lacanian terms, one might perhaps interpret the atai as a partial object, a stand-in that at once invokes and disavows the traumatic encounter with the inevitable remainder, the kernel of the real that will not be symbolized and that troubles any would-be self-contained world extimately at once from without and from within. Now Durkheim says this about mana. So we readily conceive of it in the form of a moral power that while imminent in us also represents something in us that is other than ourselves. At one level, we can simply read Durkheim as saying mana is the way we experience society's intimate presence in us to read it that way would already to be, to be to acknowledge the uncanny extimacy of the social as Durkheim understands it, its peculiarly intimate anonymity. This is, of course, the felt face of mass publicity, this intimate anonymity that only addresses us intimately insofar as it also and at the same time addresses an open-ended number of unknown others. Think, for example, of the kind of advertising that solicits an intimate resonance even as you're fully aware that the message is going out to hundreds of thousands, even millions of strangers at the same time, the kinds of ads that use insinuating phrases like, don't you just hate it when, and you know you deserve more than, and so on. One feels that curious blend of the intimate and the anonymous too in the face of the apparently personalized internet marketing recommendations, since as much as we may feel specifically addressed, we're at the same time quite aware that the recommendation has been generated by a logarithm and is only possible because of a vast distributed field of inputs. The Durkheim of elementary forms is, as we've seen, largely dealing with face-to-face -face societies, i.e. not the kind of intimately anonymous mass publics in which we start from a presumption of stranger sociality. And yet, and yet, Durkheim's understanding of what it means to become a person, to attain personhood, is just as dependent on the assumption of an impersonal identification as any mainstream liberal theorist of the modern public sphere, from Kant to Habermas. This is an important point because critical theorists often write as if pre-modern experiences of power and the substance of the social were entirely personalized until the eruption of the impersonal and distributed sovereignty of the democratic people troubled the singular presence of the prince. In direct contrast to that idea, Durkheim argues that the earliest societies conceived the social totality in entirely impersonal terms. Mana is an impersonal force, at once visceral and abstract. A totemic clan, Durkheim says, is united not necessarily by common residence or by blood, but rather by common ritual practice. So totems, for Durkheim, are a kind of pre-modern version of stranger sociality. This is part of what makes Durkheim's text so provocative, so symptomatic. Yes, it deals in an entirely unreconstructed form of primitivism. Yes, it sets up an entirely problematic kind of social evolutionary scheme. But it also, almost despite itself, keeps bringing us back to that nameless, irreducible element of surplus enjoyment that leaks out of all these cliches. Okay, to end then just with this, because it happened. <laughs>
Now, obviously enough, at some point, Durkheim got under my skin to the extent that several years ago, I had, dare I say it, a rather Zizekian dream about him. In the dream, I was reading an academic article. As I read, I was at first baffled and then increasingly irritated by the sense that the author's argument was overwhelmingly Durkheimian in orientation, and yet nowhere did he cite Durkheim. Finally reaching a point of exasperation with the textual masquerade, I turned back to the beginning of the article and discovered that its author was in fact Emile Durkheim. Thank you. is now open to questions. Hi. Please. Hi. Thank you, William. It was really great. Sorry, where, where it's me. Question? Oh, there. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's like this weirdly intimate anonymity here. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, but I think they're related. Um, Can I you don't put know the if mic I, a little closer? Yeah, if I understand uh, correctly what mana is, uh, so if, if I'm not using it right, just correct me. But um, I've been wondering, because you are talking about the ritual and the religion, and they of course are different, because in, in the base of religion is faith, and in the base of ritual is belief, and they have a, like a very different um, nature. And um, so um, I'm wondering, like connecting these two to the advertisement, um, and um, so, like, how is mana distributed between the two, the faith and the belief? Because uh, for belief, I think, like, also the primitives, they would not really, like, exactly believe in their rituals as the, for instance, Christians do, or as they believe in their, like, as Christians believe in their God. That, that would be a little bit a different uh, way of believing. Um, and then the, the second one is connected. Because you are talking that Ed speaking to you um, kind of personally, as, but it speaks also to thousands of people. Same like, for instance, a horoscope, right? It speaks to you, like you, you read it personally for yourself, uh, but it speaks also to millions of people all around the world. And uh, I read in the book by uh, Robert Fowler, which is called Illusions Without Owners, that it's sort of like all of, like all of those are... Uh, these illusions that we don't own and that we have like sort of a meta knowledge about that it's not real. Uh, but about the advertisement, about the censorship and propaganda, I don't feel like we have the same kind of knowledge that it's not real. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering how do you think about those if, 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 I, if I put my question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. So let me see if I can address some of those um, and I'm sure that there will be things in there that I miss. Um, I think actually the question of how we think about something like faith or belief in the relation between say religious or ritual practice and advertising uh, is an interesting one because in, in both cases I think there are a couple of questions to be raised. One is, is it really about faith or belief or is it about practice? Um, and I think we were having a version of this conversation yesterday on the way home from, from the conference. Of course, one of the aspects of, of Durkheim's ritual theory is that it really prioritizes practice. So it's like in the doing of the ritual that the power of whatever we might call belief arises. Uh, and that, that whatever it is that we call belief or investment or resonance or whatever it is. I mean, these are all loaded terms, right? So in a way, I want to keep an open mind as to what we mean when we use these different words to describe these phenomena. But um, when it comes to the question of, of practice being at the, at the ground of it, I think, you know, uh, for instance, Zizek, of course, is, has written quite influentially on this question of how this problem applies to things like advertising or to mass publicity, right? The, the fact that it, we actually don't have to believe in it for it to work, right? 
that in a way all that's required is that we believe that someone else believes in it, right? And, and that, that the idea that there is someone else who believes sustains our skepticism, right? And that's precisely how it works. Um, you know, this again is it's in fact also operative at the level of the advertisers themselves, right? So it's not just at the level of the consumers that this kind of displacement happens. So as the sociologist Martin, uh, what's his name, Michael Schutzen pointed out about 30 years ago, you know, advertisers advertise because other advertisers advertise, right? It's not that they necessarily are convinced of the efficacy of advertising, but they think that because other people advertise, they also need to do it. So there's a kind of self-sustaining thing of practice going on here that maybe has very little to do with, with belief or faith or, or even being convinced that this is really working. So some other kind of investment is happening here. Um, I, I, you know, the, the advertising horoscopes connection is, is actually a good one, I think, especially if we're trying to think, as I am in this project, uh, across these registers of so-called secular and so-called you know, occult or mystical schemes of resonance uh, and to think something like advertising together with something like astrology or something like magic. Um, and Adorno, of course, wrote a famous little thing called The Stars Down to Earth where he uh, sort of analyzed the uh, astrology columns. Um, and I think, you know, part of what's useful or why these things are sort of good to think with in, in this space is because and here, maybe Adorno is not a great example because of his sort of rabid uh, rejection of, uh, of mass culture. Um, I mean, part of the argument of my book is basically that Adorno stops being dialectical at the point of mass culture and that what we need to do to Adorno's theory of culture is to sort of actually force him to be dialectical, uh, force him to be consistent in his dialectics in that space where he absolutely refuses to be dialectical, which is in the space of mass culture. So what I'm trying to do to Adorno in the book is what Adorno was trying to do to Hegel in Negative Dialectics, right? where he says like Hegel claims that he's in fact consistently dialectical, but in fact there are these certain points in his process where he, al he always already knows where the, you know, where the sublation is going and that he doesn't in fact tarry with the negative in the way that he promises he will. Um, but anyway, the, the reason why these, uh, these kind of comparisons are useful for me is because it allows me to get beyond this thing uh, that Alicia was referring to earlier, which is kind of like the overdetermined argument about something like mass publicity, which is it seems as if you have only two choices, right? On the one hand, you say these are imposed or manipulated needs or desires. They're kind of, you know, it, there's some kind of conspiracy that is orchestrating our... Uh, that is brainwashing us or sort of orchestrating our, our uh, libidinal life through advertising, through cinema, whatever. And on the other hand, the sort of marketing claim that no, you know, all that mass publicity is doing is it's really just catering to uh, already existing desires. So part of what I'm trying to do here with this notion of constitutive resonance is to uh, explore a way of thinking about this that would say that uh, it's neither of those two, it's a third option which is that we need to take seriously that there is in fact in a way a kind of socio-historical ground for what becomes possible as fascination or resonance uh, in something like our relationship to anything actually. Could be advertising, could be politics, could be each other. Um, but that this, the actualization of those virtual potentials, as it were, I call them the mimetic archive in the book, um, sort of a Benjaminian, Benjaminian kind of take on this. Uh, but that the, the actualization of these virtual potentials could take many different forms, right? But it, once one of these kind of potentials for resonance has been actualized in a particular relationship of desire or identification, then retroactively it comes to seem inevitable, right? As if that was what I always wanted, as if that was, that was what was always going to happen, right? So, uh, so that's kind of the kind of process that I'm trying to suggest here. So uh, while I was listening to your talk, uh, I was trying to grapple with this uh, confusion that I seem to have with uh, between mana and uh, Romain Roland's oceanic feeling that that Freud sort of begins his civilizations and its discontent with. So could you help uh, differentiate between this oceanic feeling and mana?
Well, maybe you can start by telling me what you see as the resonance. So even in, uh, even in uh, describing the oceanic feeling, Freud talks about how uh, there, is, uh, there is an intuitive uh, unity that one feels with uh, what engulfs people when they, when they talk or experience religion, which is a sort of an oceanic feeling. And then mana being this, uh, um, this energy that sort of engulfs you when you are in a, you know, in a social setup. Right. I mean, the figure of oceanic feeling suggests a kind of lost continuity, right? Right, of, a, of, a, of a, the lost object, of a kind of non-distinction of in subject. Between and one and, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the figure of mana for me appears more like a kind of um, a figure of, yes, I mean, there's like this kind of ecstatic dimension to it of kind of an experience of resonance or merger or something like that. But also, um, I think, a, a figure of an experience of tension, right, of, uh, of the risk of self-loss, but also of the risk of was that really it, right? So I think there's like a kind of also a hysterical dimension to, to mana and to the way that, you know, the mana of mass society operates, which is like a, a constant bumping up against like, is this really the thing? Is this really the thing? Is this really the thing? And a kind of intimation of a fulfillment that lies always one step beyond. So, I mean, I found just kind of in preparation for this conversation and knowing that I was gonna be here among, you know, uh, all you guys who are, you know, uh, operating in, in a particular kind of theoretical register and reading your work, I found um, sort of the figure of, um, of the objet art to be quite helpful in thinking about the way I was trying to sort of uh, theorize mana. Um, so again, that, that doubleness of mana as being on the one hand appearing to be like a, an object desire, uh, object of desire, but also on the other hand as appearing to be the object cause of desire, right? Of not being that object, of pointing to a beyond. Thanks, William, for that paper. Um, I have a clarifatory question. Could you just work through... Uh, the, Rui, the mic is not working. Oh, sorry. Could you just... Uh, explain the difference between elective affinity and uh, constitutive resonance for me again. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I might be taking some liberties with elective affinity. Uh, I think I was kind of trying to force it into a kind of constitutive resonance model. And I, I think, you know, most people who would, um, you know, to explain elective affinity in, in, Ve in Weber's terms uh, would make an argument along the lines of like, okay, so you had the parallel emergence of Puritanism and capitalism, they discover each other and they kind of flourish together. They discover a kind of unexpected resonance that then allows them both to sort of uh, to be uh, vitalized or to flourish. I mean, I guess w what I was trying to say is like, let's see if we kind of twist that notion of elective affinity a little bit more in the direction of constitutive resonance so that it's only once, as it were, the socio-historical potentialities that can retroactively be recognized as capitalism and uh, puritanism come into a field of resonance that the two of them become comprehensible as distinctive entities retroactively. So that was kind of what I was trying to do with that. But of course, you know, uh, as, as, you know, as is well known, elective affinities was a key concept for Goethe and Benjamin picked up on it and, and so forth. But I was also trying to sort of slip in there this, this historical fact that, uh, that the notion also um, sort of, you know, has this, you know, this uh, trajectory that takes it from kind of occult knowledge through science into the literary field and then on into social science. Please. Well, thank you so much, William. This was extremely helpful, and you really pointed your finger at some absolutely crucial elements, and I particularly like the notion of uh, constitutive resonance, which I think goes a long way. I mean, it's a speculative notion which can be used in this particular context that you used it in, but it goes actually along, it, it can be used in much wider, wider context. And well, my my question, my concern would be a bit, um, is a, there's a slight danger in your talk that you universalize this concept of mana and you can then see in every society there is this element of the 
okay, the signifier and energized by Jusson's and uh, the, um, the presence of charisma and, um, and already Malinowski in the 30s made this uh, connection between the magic and primitive societies and the advertisement, um, emerging advertising industry in the 30s, Kalina Rubinstein and uh, Elizabeth Arden. And my question would be, um, I think there, there are specific shifts and if I, maybe we briefly mentioned yesterday this series Mad Men, yeah. which somehow gives the genealogy of a modern advertising industry since the 50s. There was, I mean, this series points its fingers. There was a major shift. I mean, this, it's not comparable. The, the volume and the, uh, whatever, infinity of this, uh, of this new emerging industry. I mean, there, it's not comparable even to the first half of the 20th century, let alone to the various signs of it in the 19th century that mm -hmm. had to deal with. Huh? So, um, does this shift go along with a certain major shift in symbolic authority? A shift in? In symbolic authority. Uh -huh. in, the very, in the very concept of symbolic authority. Slavo yesterday talked about the, the, the demise of the old master and the emergence of the new master who is this, you know, friend, companion, and the uh, mastery, you know, the very, the very symbolic authority gets uh, um, diffused. Uh, it, the very symbolic authority loses its sway. And somehow, somehow, yeah, this would be my, yeah. whatever, hunch, that um, the two go together. The, the demise of the symbolic authority and the incredible rise of this advertising industry, mm -hmm. which tries to promote this new uh, signifiers imbued with enjoyment, etc., etc., and which is a phenomenon of the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. It's not, I, I think Mad Men actually does uh, point to something happened, mm -hmm. something happened in the 50s, which is a different kind of different order yeah. of magnitude than what, yeah. what happened. So I'm sure you're dealing with, yep. with this in your book, I mean, which yep. you, you only presented here, sort of for the government, yep. what you yeah. should be doing. Yeah. Well, Sorry, just, did, was everyone able to hear Mladen's comment? Because then I can just repeat, the, would, that, would it be helpful if I repeated the brief question again? Because, yeah, sometimes just the, don't worry, just the accent is hard for people I know. So, um, Mladen's main uh, question was that, uh, the danger with the argument that William is making is that it seems like it universalizes the concept of manner, whereas the phenomenon of advertising to which William is referring is something which has only come up in this particular form in the last 50 years. So Aaron referred to Mad Men yesterday, and Madden was saying that the kind of advertising that we see there, um, you know, where this uh, is, a, is, a, is a serious shift in symbolic form or uh, symbolic authority, where the symbolic authority actually gets uh, diffused. And uh, you see kind of uh, the kind of incredible rise uh, of advertising. Um, yeah, sorry, I think, I, but yeah, I think, does that help at all? So it's about how does William deal with this shift in symbolic authority? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, and I'm gonna try and answer it at a number of levels. Um, First, this project, The Manner of Mass Society, this book, is uh, not an empirical study in my usual anthropological sense. Uh, it's a kind of speculative theoretical book that whose, in a way, ethnographic field is this kind of uh, complex textual corpus that sort of crosses between sort of classic anthropology and critical theory. And most of what I focused on here was kind of the classic anthropology part with some nods to the, the critical theory part. But of course the term mana crops up in, uh, in Horkheimer and Adorno, it, you know, it pops up here and there. And, and I think too that, you know, that Sloterdijk's phrase constitutive resonance has a tremendous potential uh, to operate as a kind of analytic uh, across a you know, vast field. It's true that at some level I think there is, that in a way I'm, I'm positing um, mana in a kind of quasi-universalizing way, or, or let's say mana as one word for something that might be recognized as or posited as a kind of universal problem, formal problem of, of jouissance and signification. 
Um, but uh, there's another kind of struggle that I want to be quite careful with there, which is that, uh, of course, in the sociological and anthropological literature, mana and terms like it, it wasn't the only one. I mean, there were other terms that competed with it, um, often derived from um, Native American societies, orenda, wakan, manitou. These were all terms that sort of were used in a similar way, but in a way, mana, for complex reasons, became in the late 19th century and early 20th century a kind of uh, uh, term that was at once, you know, uh, a member of its own class and the name of its class, right? Um, what I would want to be quite careful about is sort of not falling into the trap that a lot of those discussions uh, did, I think, which was to posit a kind of unambiguous substantiality to mana, as if we were talking about like a, just an ontological substance in the world. Uh, but on the other hand, I wouldn't want to go the Levi-Strauss route either, which was to say that mana really was just kind of a name for a kind of um, insufficiency of signification or a kind of gap in signification. So I am kind of trying to, in a way, have my cake and eat it because I, I care not only about, as it were, sort of a crisis of structure that might be called mana, I also want to explain something about the phenomenology of resonance uh, and what we might call affect or aesthetic experience. Um, so, so that's, I think, why in some ways my discussion sometimes hovers in a, an uncomfortable way between a kind of substantiality of, of, of phenomenology and of you know, the feeling of mana and on the other hand, uh, a kind of positing of mana as a name that we can give to a certain kind of formal contradiction or, or sort of repetitive um, crisis in, in the social process. Uh, second level, the book is making an argument about a, a particular historical moment in a way, which is the, what I'm calling the mana moment, the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, and why mana should have become, su the question is why mana should have become such an obsessive concern uh, for social scientists and people in, uh, you know, related fields, comparative religion and some, some philosophers around this period. Um, and what it was about that particular historical conjuncture is kind of a moment that saw two things basically happening at the same time. One was the rise of what we kind of now understand as mass-mediated society, uh, and the other one was uh, the consolidation of colonial authority around the world and the place of anthropology as a kind of attempt to make sense of that conjuncture and often disavowing that conjuncture as well, right? So in a lot of early anthropology, we have a kind of strenuous attempt to kind of make it seem as if the field, uh, the field in which the anthropologist is working is in fact completely isolated from the larger political economy of uh, colonial authority and, and industrial communications that made it possible in the first place, right? And so one of the things that I'm trying to do in uh, the kind of genealogical section of the book where I'm tracking how mana works in these texts is to point to these kind of symptomatic moments of uh, ambivalence where uh, on the one hand someone will say like just explain all the, word, the ways in which mana is a kind of quintessentially primitive phenomenon and yet on the very next page or maybe even like later in the same sentence we'll say something like yeah but on the other hand this is a universal phenomenon and we have something like it in the modern world as well. So I'm sort of tracking the way that this becomes a kind of symptom of this sort of unresolvable ambivalence about you know this kind of anthropological settlement of, of sort of the primitive field site and how it keeps this kind of um, the symptom keeps returning in the form of this a figure like mana. So that's another dimension. Now in terms of your question about sort of shifting forms of symbolic authority, um, so this book is a kind of conceptual prolegomenon to an empirical project that I've been working on for a long, long time. Some of my friends think I will never finish it, uh, but it's basically um, a study of, let's say, uh, forms of mass publicity, both commercial and political, in India in broadly the Mad Men period, or a little bit later, so, or intersects with some of the Mad Men period, so mid-60s to mid-70s. And it's focused empirically on the story of the rise and fall of a particularly charismatic ad man 
and his agency, which existed only in this period, 1965 to 1975. And part of what I'm interested in there, and, and here I would sort of push back on this kind of singularizing epochal notion of transformations in forms of symbolic authority, like this idea that we go like in, in lockstep you know, from one form of symbolic authority to another at a particular moment. Part of what I'm interested in there is actually precisely the sort of contradiction between different forms of symbolic authority in different uh, kind of social fields at the same historical moment. So, for instance, in India in, let's say, 1965 to 1975, first of all, it's rather strange in a certain way to be working in advertising because you're working within a, a broadly a state-controlled economy. Uh, and the very figure of consumerism itself is not a, a sort of an officially approved activity or aspiration. Uh, and yet, there it is, and people are making these things, sort of in a way inventing a discourse for something that doesn't actually have a kind of official relevance in a certain way. Uh, at the same time, there's also this way in which there's a, there's a very kind of... Uh, ambivalent relationship between the form of symbolic authority that you get in advertising at this moment such as it is, such as it can be under those conditions, and the forms of symbolic authority that you're getting in politics at that very same moment. Uh, and of course, uh, India being India, there's a lot of crossover between the people working in advertising and the people working in politics. Sometimes they're married to each other, sometimes they're, they're you know, cousins and people are moving back and forth. This is also the period of Indira Gandhi's rise to power. It's also the period of uh, you know, the, the Pakistan War of 1971 and the liberation of Bangladesh. It's a period of economic crisis of uh, rioting everywhere, of devaluation, of shortages, and of a kind of authoritarian populism that becomes possible through as a kind of response to all those, uh, all those problems. So part of what I'm, I'm and of this all ends you know, in 1975, conveniently, as this agency that I'm tracking collapses in a kind of hailstorm of bad debts and recriminations, and pretty much in the same month almost, Indira Gandhi declares her emergency, right? Which lasts from June of 1975 to what is it, March of 77 or so, right? So there's also a question in here of a kind of non-continuity and sort of almost like a, a, a sort of uh, impasse in relations between different forms of social, uh, of symbolic authority in the same historical space. And part of what I've kind of been trying to track is this question of how that's dealt with or not dealt with or spoken about or not spoken about. The fact that you have you know, rioting in the streets and at the same time you have this production of a certain kind of form of advertising which ostensibly doesn't seem to even notice that that stuff is going on. And yet of course it's being published on the opposite page of a newspaper in which those riots and you know, the political crisis is being described and analyzed. So, that also is, is very interesting to me. So that would be my kind of response to that, that question. Thank you. Yes. Well, and thanks. Is there more time? Oh. Yeah, yeah, we have yeah. another 10 minutes. Excellent. No, um, I mean, there's so much to say in terms of like the connections with Lacanian psychoanalysis, but more generally psychoanalysis. I mean, one usually focuses on the connection with, uh, between Lacan and, and Lévi-Strauss. And to the best of my knowledge, actually, the reference, the vague reference in the connection between the mana and what will have been objet petit art is made quite explicitly by Lacan himself in the late 50s. But then the whole question goes back to pre-Lacanian psychoanalysis and names such as uh, Giza Roheim and uh, other practicing anthropologists who were also psychoanalysts who, uh, unfortunately, we no longer read as they would deserve. But um, I had two points. Maybe I will focus first on one, and then let's see if we have time. But um, to go back to um, Mladen's question, so isn't there a risk of universalizing, if I got to the question correctly in the answer, uh, the, notion of, um, the notion of mana, and hence, um, in a sense, having a clash with the specificity of, of publicity, PR, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, I think there isn't, and the answer you can find there, well, because if you, you know, universalize that, Mladen seemed to imply 
actually have a clash with the specificity, historical specificity of the sociological, you can say, phenomenon of publicity, hence you don't have a trans-historical dimension, right? But I think in what you um, replied, I think you already have an answer, and actually a very Lacanian answer. Like you said, like, if I understood you correctly, it's not a matter of understanding mana as a universal, but it's actually a matter of understanding mana as a member of its own uh, uh, class, right? And I think that's a very Lacanian answer, because in a way, objet petit a is a member of its own class, you know? It is, it is not to be understood in terms of a universal horizon of desire, of, object cause of desire, but actually as the ubiquity, paraphrasing like an, of an empty set, of an empty, empty set that works as a cause, uh, well, for desire, but also like for, for civilization in its discontents at large, right? So that would be like my, my triangulation with your exchange, which is incredibly interesting, even from a sheer Lacanian perspective. The other question actually, well, which is more of a comment, but also a question is, going back to Durkheim, and there's a point when you, um, in passing, mentioned a quite strong distinction between religion and magic. And that also rings like a very strong bell for a Lacanian, because before the famous theory discourses of Seminar 17, Lacan had already developed in very beautiful articles science, on science a couple of years earlier, a proto-theory of this, whilst in religion here, Christianity is at the center, I'm not sure it's, it would be like universally applicable. What is the stake is that we know that we don't know, but there is he who knows, right, like God, and we will know in the future, at the end of time, literally, with, with, with shamanism rather than, you know, like, man, it was shamanism that Lacan like, like was specifically focusing on, with, with magic, the fact that we all know that he knows, like the shaman or, or the magician. And, and that gives the efficiency that creates simplifying like a kind of like mm. a, a cultural glue. So basically my, question, my two questions are, do you think like my translation sort of solves the tension um, between um, Mladen's very illicit question and your answer? And the second question is, would this idea this distinction, Lacanian distinction, very quite formal between religion and magic, which was really at the center of his interest in, in the mid-60s, apply to Dorcan or not? Just superficially hearing you describe it that way, it sounds like the Lacanian distinction is actually quite similar to the distinction that Durkheim draws, right? Uh, although Durkheim uses different language to describe it. Um, as you were talking about this idea of sort of uh, the notion of uh, ultimate causes and, you know, there is someone who knows, we will know in the future, right? In a funny way, that's part of what's always disturbed me about Levi-Strauss's critique of Moss um, and Durkheim on mana, which is, you know, basically Levi-Strauss makes this argument that, you know, Moss, when he talks about mana, has kind of misrecognized uh, a kind of um, effect of signification, uh, a kind of effect of the floating signifier as a real social uh, practice, right? Uh, and that the only place where mana is really operative is in Moses' own writing, right? As a kind of, as a kind of uh, oper operator of mystification, right? Now, there, I think Levi-Strauss is himself extremely interestingly ambivalent here because on the one hand, he says, he's writing as if, you know, there's this element to Levi-Strauss which is a kind of scientizing progressivism, right? So, like, sort of, we will know in the future, we will have, like, the signifier will be more ag uh, adequate, you know? Uh, we will know, we will have an answer, and we won't need these kind of floating concepts of these kind of indeterminacies anymore, right? But then on the other hand, there's an element to Levi-Strauss which is sort of saying that this really is a kind of irreducible aspect of, of human experience where he, it seems to me like he's coming closer to Lacan, right? So, um, for instance, in this discussion of, of mana in Mos, on the one hand, he wraps Mos on the, on the knuckles for having kind of t been taken in by mana. Uh, but on the other hand, he says, well, but we're really not just, we're really not talking about anything fundamentally different than when we like talk about, you know, when we say that, uh, he gives this example, when like a sexy woman has, we say that we ha she has oomph. Like, that's, that's mana, right? So he also gives it this kind of universalizing, sort of irreducible quality. 
he also said something like the, uh, the uh, like, that here we are in the presence of something where the obstacle to science is the same thing as the surety of art, right? So that there's a way in which like he's at the same time uh, promising a kind of future in which we will all know and at the same time uh, saying, well, you know, this principle that we can call mana or something else is at the very core of what we understand as aesthetic experience or the poetic or whatever. So I know that doesn't really answer your question, but it's like a, you know, a way around it. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, <clears throat> so obviously my question is very similar to Milan's and, and Lorenzo's, but I also want to say, I mean, I think that's extremely um, helpful and really stimulating this return to, to Durkheim. And I also you know, very much appreciate the links you're making with psychoanalysis. I think if you wanted to make it even more explicit, I mean, Lacan is talking about mana in the, in the late 50s via Levi-Strauss and also via the concept of the zero symbol, which goes directly to the question you raised uh, via De Martino, who I also think is an extremely interesting, one of the most interesting Italian thinkers of the 20th century, of this question of what grounds a lived world. And that brings me, okay, to the question, you know, that I think was already articulated, but it, I, I would say that this, this problem of the relationship between the trans-historical and the historical. Mm -hmm. And we also had this yesterday. I think somebody asked in Lorenzo's presentation, is enjoyment like a trans-historical category? And sort of yes and no is mm -hmm. the only kind of good answer. But, you know, on the one hand, you have the idea that what grounds a lived world? So I go back to this question via De Martino. I mean, in a sense, nothing. There's no ground of any lived world, but there will always be some privileged points mm -hmm. of uh, controlling presence. Mm -hmm sort of grasp us tyrannically because they're grounded in nothing but themselves and that we can analyze, you know, the specificity of those, you know, points of controlling presence in different cultures at different times, etc. Okay. So that would be a kind of trans-historical structure of, let's say, human society. Right. On the other hand, you can also analyze that in terms of certain historical logics of how that controlling presence works. And those change. Yeah. So there's also a historical specificity. Um, of that. And to give one example, just to insert, um, let me say my own interests into this, but it's funny to me that Lacan, when he talks about mana, he links it to the idea of symbolic debt. He also talks about mana in terms of debt. And then he'll say there's a different logic of debt in different historical moments, something that uh, Mladen was also uh, analyzing. There can be a logic of a limited debt, of an infinite debt, of an internalization of debt. But these are, these are then historical categories that address like trans-historical. So I think that maybe is, the, is a little bit of the tension uh, that, that one is locating in your talk to, 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 let's say, more explicitly address this idea of a, yeah, a trans-historical problematic but the historical specificity mm -hmm. of how things are organized. And advertising seems such an interesting uh, uh, you know, uh, object of study in which to, in which to talk about this. So, thank you. Sorry, William. Yeah. Uh, we can take Alenka's comment as well, and then if you could respond okay. to them together, because okay. we're just short of time. It's actually a very, very brief comment or kind of suggestion. Thank you very much. I really, really like this. And I was just thinking, um, you said that you were trying to avoid two traps. One was to conceive of uh, man as this kind of substance, and uh, on the other hand, just this gap in signification. And I think at least this would be my reading of the very notion of objet the eye in Lacan or of enjoyment, uh, the, the way to avoid both traps without losing the, what is interesting in them uh, would be to say, I would say that the, uh, this is precisely for Lacan, uh, jouissance is the substance, the strange substance that emerges at the very point of the gap in the signifying order. So it's not that they're absolutely related, but it's not simply that there is this kind of a falling down of uh, missing of one signifier and the enjoyment appears precisely at that place. And this is why it can contaminate uh, all the signifiers that kind of uh, are really, so just structurally, I mean, this is yeah. very kind of abstractly put, but uh, it could be a way of um, articulating to those. Thank you, that's really helpful. And I'm hoping that you will all give me these references and continue the conversation, you know, in the future, because I, this is, Obviously, I've had some kind of longish-term engagement with Lacanian categories, but never gone into them in the kind of um, chapter and verse manner in which you guys do. So I feel like a bit of an imposter treading on delicate ground here. Uh, but so what I would say just briefly in relation to Aaron's comment about the historical and the trans-historical, 
I, I appreciate that point a lot and with Lacanian categories but never gone into them in the kind of um, chapter and verse manner in which you guys do. So I feel like a bit of an imposter treading on delicate ground here. Uh, but so what I would say just briefly in relation to Aaron's comments about the historical and the transhistorical, I, I appreciate that point a lot. And but part of what I would I guess want to respond with is to maybe say a little bit more just very briefly about something else that this book is trying to do. Um, and that is that because I'm writing from within anthropology, I'm uh, sort of trying to develop um, a theory of the grounds of, reson of constitutive resonance that would not fall back on culturalism, right? Uh, so that would not sort of um, take this step back into explaining why things work or why things resonate in terms of some kind of cultural logic, right? Of this world is like this, that world is like this, right? Or this, this tradition operates this way or that tradition operates. And we saw a little bit of that arising yesterday in, in the Q&A at, uh, you know, Alenka's talk. I think, you know, uh, Slavoj had this interesting way of, of sort of disavowing the culturalist question while in fact asking it. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but so, so that's kind of part of what I'm trying to do. And, and my, uh, I sort of just mentioned it very much in passing here without elaboration. My alternative to culture is this thing that I'm calling the mimetic archive, which is a sort of Benjaminian construct, right? And is intended to provide a way of thinking about how it is that certain kind of resonances become possible in unexpected and yet locatable ways, right? So that, like, just as Benjamin says that, you know, in, in the kind of detritus of the past and in our built forms and in our sort of common experience in our, you know, in a way, in, in a sense, in the unconscious of social life, there are all these potentialities that kind of flash up across time, right? So that you get these sudden uh, sort of moments of, of nowness that are, that are short circuits across the past and the present. Uh, and that, in a way, amount to activations or actualizations of a kind of unrealized potential of the past which couldn't have been, as it were, activated until this particular moment, right? These uncanny kind of correspondences between past and present. That's kind of what I'm trying to do, uh, both as an analytic in how we might think of uh, something like constitutive resonance and why it happens when it happens, and how we can only, as it were, explain it retroactively, like once it's happened. But then, of course, it seems in that way like it was always going to happen. Uh, but also, that's what I'm trying to do with the very concept mana itself, right? So I'm, I'm trying to do a kind of trans-historical short circuit with this sort of earlier kind of speculative moment in anthropology, right? Uh, and think about what it is about this kind of current moment of reflection where we're really, you know, it, the culture theory is exhausted, you know, some kind of historicism is exhausted. Uh, how do we how do we think about the sort of the potentials that can be activated uh, you know, across these moments through concepts like mana, which is not to say that, like, again, to lend mana some kind of eternal transhistorical status, but rather to think of it as kind of a name that can be given to this sort of uh, encounter or this moment that happens and which flashes up in a kind of vital and perhaps also terrifying way. I think uh, we can close there. Um, we'll be back at two after lunch for uh, the paper by Faisal Devji and then close uh, the conference with the paper by Joan Kopchak. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.